Now, if you thought the Big Bang was controversial, that's nothing compared to the modern theory of evolution. Mention creation or design in a mainstream biology department office, and you're likely to be met with rolled eyes and perhaps condescending attitudes. Mention evolution in a church, and you're likely to find shaking heads and disapproving looks. The fact is that there is justification for both sides, but often neither gives the other enough credit. In this study, based on a report titled Macro Delusion that I wrote for a technical writing class, we'll first focus on knocking down some of the misconceptions that a lot of people have about evolution, and try to separate the fact from the theory. Then we'll consider a few of the prevailing challenges to it, challenges brought by a young scientific movement called intelligent design. As you probably already know, the theory of evolution was championed by 19th century naturalist Charles Darwin in his book On the Origin of Species. Inspired by observations he made while on a worldwide scientific sea voyage, Darwin wrote the book after years of fine-tuning the concept of natural selection into a relatively comprehensive explanation for the origin of life as we know it. Put simply, natural selection is the tendency of living organisms to adapt to their surroundings over many generations. For example, the finches that Darwin found on the Galapagos Islands were all finches, but due to each population living in a different environment, over time the gene pool of that population became specialized. Birds on one island had smaller beaks that were more adapted to the foods on their island than did birds that lived on another. Because the pool of reproduction was isolated for many generations, the entire bird population gradually diverged from the birds on other islands until they became very different. While significant variations in a bird population take centuries to occur, natural selection has actually been observed in human lifetimes, as in the case of bacteria populations becoming resistant to certain antibiotics. What I've just described is microevolution, or natural selection occurring at the species level. This process is generally accepted by scientists of all philosophical persuasions, and is well supported by observable evidence. Where the theory of evolution gets dicey is when you expand it to the development of new species and families of creatures with completely new biological characteristics. This is macroevolution, and is the theory that modern evolutionists say explains the entire tree of life, that upward branching representation of life's supposed development from very basic organisms. Let me repeat, macroevolution is a theory, a hypothesis used by scientists to make sense out of the phenomena that they observe in nature. There are many very intelligent and educated scientists on the side of macroevolution, but there are also many who are far from convinced. Today, many of the most scientific challenges to the theory of macroevolution are put forth by those who favor intelligent design as the alternative. According to intelligent design think tank, the Discovery Institute, the theory of intelligent design holds that certain features of the universe and of living things are best explained by an intelligent cause, not an undirected process such as natural selection. The intelligent design, or ID, movement grew out of the Ad Hoc Origins Committee, a diverse group that was unified by skepticism of Darwinian doctrine and dissatisfaction with the bias-driven arguments of creation science. Since the 90s, ID theory has gained popularity and recognition through successful scientific books as well as a number of legal proceedings in which the teaching of ID in schools has been debated. Naturally, this growth in popularity has not gone unnoticed by the evolution favoring scientific establishment. Seeing ID as a religiously motivated threat to science, evolutionists have responded vigorously. Unfortunately, this response has not always been in the form of intellectual discussion instead taking a more ad hominem approach. Evolutionists like Michael Shermer have written books trying to refute ID, but in them resort to alleging that ID is made up of uneducated religious people who ignore the evidence in favor of preaching their philosophical beliefs. Many of their refutations of ID arguments do not in fact address the technical details, but instead answer a simplified form of the ID argument with a generalized regurgitation of the typical Darwinist mantra. That is, the fossil record and other scientific experiments have practically proven macroevolution. This portrayal of ID is unfair and should be obviously baseless if one just reads their arguments for themselves. While there are indeed plenty of theists in the ID movement, their challenges to evolution are based upon honest science and do not test the theory against religious teachings or biblical references.
The concept of an intelligent designer is not used to interpret science. Rather, science leads them to conclude that a designer must exist. Before we look at some of the specific areas in which ID theorists find macroevolution inadequate, there are a few important points I need to make. Just because ID ultimately involves something non-scientific, in this case a supernatural designer, that doesn't mean that its objections to macroevolution are unscientific, or even that the theory itself cannot have scientific justification. Evolutionist Robert T. Pennock wrote the following after responding to an ID argument. One may, of course, retain religious faith in a designer who transcends natural processes, but there is no way to dust for his fingerprints. To someone who understands the concept of a supernatural designer, this is nonsense. The fingerprints of a designer are precisely what we observe in nature. Science, then, being the study of the natural world, is the means by which we can dust for these fingerprints. Science cannot explain how a supernatural being might have intervened in natural processes, but if such intervention did take place, it could certainly describe the effects. An accusation hurled from both sides of the macroevolution debate is that the other side is biased and lets ideology guide their interpretation of the facts. This is a well-known criticism of ID as we observed earlier. Evolutionists point to ID's concept of a supernatural designer and see a mixing of religion and science. They are right to point out the potential relevance of these presuppositions. For belief in God certainly may, and often does, diminish one's objectivity or influence their motives. However, so can unbelief in God. At the 1993 annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, famous evolutionary philosopher Michael Ruse told his fellow naturalists that one should be sensitive to what I think history shows, namely that evolution, akin to religion, involves making certain a priori or metaphysical assumptions, which at some level cannot be proven empirically. Evolutionist scientist Richard Lewontin in explaining the danger of allowing for the miraculous in science, said, Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. The fact that many evolutionists adhere to a naturalistic assumption is not inherently bad. In many ways, it makes them good scientists, since science cannot directly observe the supernatural. However, if there does exist a supernatural, this presupposition could blind them to the true explanation for natural phenomena, and it could lead them to make incorrect conclusions. As mentioned earlier, science can't tell us if a supernatural designer exists, but it could provide evidence by observing its handiwork. There are numerous areas where the plausibility of macroevolution is debated, spanning a variety of scientific fields. We don't have time to go into them all, so we'll instead focus on three of the more fundamental ones. In his Origin of Species, Charles Darwin devotes one section to a discussion of how the eye and other complicated organs could have evolved through a sequence of improvements. In it, he makes an important concession. He says that if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which cannot possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Now Darwin goes on to explain how he doubts such an organ exists and cautions anyone against too quickly coming to this conclusion. He gives several examples of organs simultaneously achieving a number of functions and describes how they could have been specialized and improved by natural selection to produce more complex organs in subsequent species. Even today, many years after Darwin, the evolutionary explanation for how the eye could have evolved is based upon imagined intermediate steps between the various light-sensitive organs that we see in nature. They don't know how it happened, they can just visualize a possible sequence. So the evolution of the eye is not a proven concept. 
Nevertheless, it's not organs such as these that biochemist Michael Behe uses to explain his concept of irreducible complexity. Behe's 1996 book, Darwin's Black Box, The Biochemical Challenge to Evolution, was and still is one of the driving forces behind the growing ID movement. And naturally, it has been met with firm resistance by evolutionists. In his book, and in subsequent debates and articles, some of which were published in peer-reviewed journals such as Protein Science, Behe explains how decades of research into molecular biology have found molecular machines that would be effectively non-functional if a single component or protein was missing. Such machines, he says, are irreducibly complex, which he defines as a single system composed of several well-matched interacting parts that contribute to the basic function, wherein the removal of any one of the parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning. This is different from the complexity of organs that Darwin was familiar with, such as the eye, which may be theoretically modified to make it simpler, yet still somewhat functional. One of the systems Behe describes as irreducibly complex is the blood clotting process. A beneficial blood clot is the result of a complex sequence of events involving 20 different proteins that all trigger each other in a specific order. Behe proposes that natural selection could not have built this sequence, because any simpler precursor would have been dangerous and even fatal to the animal. Blood clotting expert and biochemistry professor Russell Doolittle rebutted this claim by citing a study in mice, which found that the removal of two proteins in this sequence yielded mice which were, quote, for all practical purposes, normal. Behe responded to this, pointing out that these mice were far from normal. Instead, according to the authors of the report, they exhibited the same problems as mice which lacked the clot-forming protein fibrinogen. In other words, they hemorrhage, their blood doesn't clot, and they die when they're pregnant. Other scientists have contested Behe's blood clotting example in somewhat different ways. But their criticisms are generally hypothetical and do not seem to be based on a greater understanding of the blood clotting process. Behe gives many other examples of irreducible complex machines, and while evolutionists have tried to disprove many of them, they have largely failed to give satisfactory natural explanations. In other words, the debate is far from over. According to the University of California Museum of Paleontology, the Cambrian period marks an important point in the history of life on Earth. It is the time when most of the major groups of animals first appear in the fossil record. This event is sometimes called the Cambrian Explosion because of the relatively short time over which this diversity of forms appears. In the Cambrian period, we see a very diverse and plentiful assortment of life forms, whereas prior to this time, the only traces of life were prokaryotes, or bacteria, and eukaryotes, the type of cell found in plants and animals. Just how big of an explosion the Cambrian was becomes increasingly evident as more specimens from the period are uncovered. The 1909 Burgess Shale discovery, along with others in Greenland and China, have uncovered a number of phyla, distinct animal body plans, unlike any others found previously. For example, scientists identified 20 completely different arthropod phyla in addition to the four that were already known. Rather than the Cambrian showing a few new life forms from which others were to develop, we instead see many wildly distinct life forms all appear in relatively short succession. This paints a very different picture than the evolutionary tree of life, which generally forms an upside down cone shape with very few variations at the bottom and many at the top. Co-author of the naturalist theory of punctuated equilibrium, Stephen Gold, summarizes the situation as follows. Nearly 2.5 billion years of prokaryotic cells and nothing else. Two-thirds of life's history in stasis at the lowest level of recorded complexity. Another 700 million years of the larger and much more intricate eukaryotic cells, but no aggregation to multicellular animal life. Then, in the 100 million year wink of a geological eye, three outstandingly different faunas, from Ediacara to Timotian to Burgess, since then, more than 500 million years of wonderful stories, triumphs, and tragedies, but not a single new phylum, or basic anatomical design, added to the Burgess complement. Why did life remain at stage one for two-thirds of its history, if complexity offers such benefits?
Why did the origin of multicellular life proceed as a short pulse through three radically different faunas, rather than a slow and continuous rise of complexity? Cambrian experts, such as Mikhail Fadunkin, have proposed explanations for why the Cambrian was more conducive to life's development, but at most they only clear up how such life could have survived, not how it might have developed. The Cambrian explosion thus remains one of the mysteries of macroevolution. Future geological discoveries may fill in the gaps, but so far science has been unable to satisfactorily explain why so many different phyla appeared in the Cambrian and never again. If the explosion of new and entirely distinct life forms in the Cambrian isn't enough of a mystery, what if one goes much further back to the first development of life? There was an abundance of life, bacteria and individual organic cells, well before the Cambrian. How this very early life developed is something we will probably never know for sure, but that doesn't mean we can't consider what would have probably had to happen and conclude something about whether unguided natural processes could have produced it. Now lest we dismiss this early prokaryotic and eukaryotic life as simple, it's worth noting the description by Arizona State University professor Paul Davies in his book The Origin of Life. The living cell is the most complex system known to man. Its hosts of specialized molecules, many found nowhere else but within living material, are themselves enormously complex. They execute a dance of exquisite fidelity, orchestrated with breathtaking precision. Scientists have done a great deal of research to try to determine how life may have originated on the early Earth, and much of this has to do with understanding the composition of the Earth's early atmosphere. In 1953, Stanley Miller of the University of Chicago was able to produce amino acids by combining heat, electricity, and what was then believed to be the Earth's early atmosphere, hydrogen, water, methane, and ammonia. After that, scientists decided the Earth's early atmosphere must have been comprised mostly of carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and water from volcanic outgassing. Experiments with these gases mostly failed Miller's experiment. Yet a recent study claims that the early atmosphere was indeed hydrogen rich, due to it escaping the atmosphere at a slower rate than previously thought, and therefore more like the environment in Miller's experiment. If this is true, it would seem to show that some of the basic components of life could indeed have been made naturally. Now does this mean that life could have developed on its own through heat and electrical bursts, Frankenstein style? Not so fast. For one thing, where did this electrical en energy come from? Could conventional lightning have occurred in an atmosphere rich in hydrogen and lacking oxygen? But more importantly, even if amino acids were produced by some natural process, does this really get us that much closer to life? Scientists get excited about the possibility of amino acids being generated naturally because proteins, the building blocks of life, are comprised of chains of them. The proteins in living organisms are created by DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, which is two strands of molecules coiled into a helix, RNA, which is ribonucleic acid, similar to DNA but simpler molecule, and ribosomes, which are protein assembling factories. In very simple terms, the DNA contains the design for the protein, which is carried by messenger RNA to a ribosome, which then builds the protein out of amino acids that are delivered by transfer RNA. The messenger RNA controls the ribosome's production so that it stops at the right time, and voila, you have a protein. To get around this complexity, scientists have suggested that at one time in Earth's history, there was only RNA. DNA, after all, is formed from synthesized RNA. But this hardly reduces the complexity of the system. If anything, it simply makes RNA fill more roles. Scientists also point out that some of the base molecules of RNA and DNA have been produced in labs in a way which could have conceivably occurred in nature. But as with the amino acids, the existence of these units separate from their highly complex arrangement in RNA and DNA is hardly an explanation for how they could have organized themselves unaided. The process that produces these and simpler forms of nucleic acid is itself extremely complex. Additionally, the intermediate steps leading to these acids are of dubious advantage, which would be necessary for them to be naturally selected. Because of these difficulties, some scientists have shifted the problem to potential precursor replication systems, whose existence is entirely hypothetical.
There are numerous other important questions, such as where the information for the DNA came from in the first place, and what determined it to be meaningful before there was a larger system to put the proteins to use. The incredible complexity of something as fundamental to life as DNA and protein production leads ID theorists to one conclusion. A designer had to have been involved. There are many books and websites written from an ID perspective which make for very interesting reading if you care to learn more about this subject. For now though, we will conclude with this. The theory of macroevolution, though based upon the scientific concept of natural selection, has so far been inadequate at explaining the large jumps in complexity that we see throughout the fossil record. Now that we've established this, we're ready to look at the biblical creation account and see how it fits in with what science does tell us, such as the age of the earth and the locations of fossils buried in the earth's crust.